So, dann beginnen wir heute sogar überpünktlich. Ich darf Sie recht herzlich zur Pressekonferenz der Krefeld Pinguine begrüßen. Ähm, in Abwesenheit von Frau schneider bedien die heute leider krankheitsbedingt nicht dabei ist, werde ich durch die Pressekonferenz führen. Ähm, wir begrüßen rechts den Aufsichtsratsvorsitzenden Herrn Wolfgang Schulz und in der Mitte unseren Cheftrainer Herrn Ricardono. Ich darf, bevor wir die Pressekonferenz starten, zwei, drei Splittermeldungen für morgen oder allgemein bekannt geben. Für morgen haben wir 6.600 Tickets, Stand jetzt abgesetzt. Das bedeutet eben, dass wir eine ordentliche Kulisse morgen haben werden. Wir weisen nochmal darauf hin, dass die Zuschauer möglichst den Vorverkauf doch bitte nutzen sollen. Selbstverständlich sind die Abendkasten geöffnet, aber bevor sich lange Schlangen bilden, weisen wir nochmal darauf hin. Für München sind wir bei knapp 3.100, aber auch da gehen wir jetzt davon aus, ähm, ja, mit dem guten Spiel morgen, aber auch über die Weihnachtstage, dass sich da noch was tut und dass wir da eine gute Zuschauerzahl auch erreichen werden. Eine Sache, die gestern oder heute Morgen in den sozialen Medien aufgetreten ist, es war gestern Abend eigentlich ein Fantreffen geplant. Ähm, Fans standen hier vor der Tür und ähm, das war eine Misskommunikation unsererseits, den Schuh müssen wir uns anziehen, ist aber mit dem Fanprojekt inzwischen geklärt. Es sollte eigentlich eine Aussprache oder ein Gespräch zwischen dem äh, alten Cheftrainer Herrn Fritzmeier und den Fans geben. Das hatten wir vor zehn Tagen mit dem Fanprojekt so organisiert. Aufgrund der Tatsache, dass er nicht mehr Cheftrainer ist, ist dieses Treffen eben, hat das Treffen nicht mehr stattgefunden. Nur wir haben keine offizielle Absage dazu geschrieben. Wie gesagt, wir haben uns beim Fanprojekt dazu entschuldigt. Ähm, aber dieses Treffen wird natürlich umgehend nachgeholt, weil es werden ja auch andere Dinge besprochen. Und wie gesagt, wir sind ja in der Kommunikation. Und zu guter Letzt, ähm, heute stand noch in der Zeitung das Thema äh, Gehaltszahlung, dass da Gehälter zu spät gezahlt worden sind. Das stimmt nicht. Alle Gehälter sind in dieser Saison pünktlich den Spielern, aber auch den anderen Angestellten, auch der Geschäftsstelle überwiesen worden. Von daher stimmt das nicht. Alle haben pünktlich ihre Gehälter bekommen. So, von daher darf ich jetzt das Wort an unseren Aufsichtsratsvorsitzenden Herrn Schulz geben. Herr Schulz, bitte. Ja, äh ich freue mich sehr, dass ich Rick an meiner Seite sehe. Aber bevor wir äh, zur Personalie Rick Aduno und Cheftrainer kommen, würde ich mich gerne als erstes einmal bei Hans Fritzmeier und seinem Co-Trainer bedanken für die wirklich intensive, massive und gute Arbeit. Sie haben unglaublich viel Zeit eingesetzt, die Mannschaft auf ein Top-Niveau gebracht, dass es dann hinterher nicht reichte, Tut uns allen leid, aber so ist es einmal und äh, ich möchte mich trotzdem offiziell bei beiden für ihre Arbeit bedanken. Äh, Ricardo ist hier. Ich freue mich darüber sehr. Äh, wir haben reagieren müssen, wie da ja die spielerische und äh, Tabellensituation es nicht zuließ, so weiterzumachen. Wir sind auf dem letzten Platz im Moment. Das ist definitiv nicht unser Anspruch. Wir haben eine Mannschaft, die sowohl kostenmäßig oder auch von der Papierform eigentlich weit oben spielt oder weiter oben spielen müsste. Das haben wir in den letzten Wochen nicht erreicht. Und aus diesem Grunde mussten wir eine Änderung herbeiführen. Rick Aduno war bereit, diesen, ich nenne das mal Feuerwehrjob, zu übernehmen. Das ist für mich aller Ehren wert. Das macht nicht jeder Trainer. Vor allen Dingen nicht ein Trainer, der erst vor einem Jahr etwa Krefel verlassen hat. Für meine Begriffe zeigt das ganz deutlich und intensiv, wie Rick Aduno zu Krefeld steht zu den Pinguinen steht und das ist nicht nur aller Ehren wert, sondern für mich bewundernswert. Rick, Elke. Okay, Rick, ne? also for you let's have some eventful days and uh, not only because you have to undecorate your Christmas tree, I heard about that. Um, so before talking about the... Okay. Before talking about the, the sports part and the game tomorrow against Cologne, um, may you describe your, your last days and yeah, how 
how you made the decision for the Crave and Penguins. Yeah, um, uh, I'll do it in English because my Deutsch has been a year away now, so I tried to get the people in Canada to speak German while I was there, so it was hard for me to keep talking German, but I will get back to that. I think that's really important, and I think it's very respectful of where I coach in the city that I coach in, and I love trying to speak German, and so does my wife. So, anyway, with that being said, yeah, with the decision, uh, you know, I was still uh, part of the Krefeld Penguins regardless. I would send countless scouting reports in throughout the last season. I took Franz on a very intensive scouting trip, and uh, at the end of last season, we had a great relationship while we were doing it. Um, I showed him the, the way I think it should be done, and, uh, you know, uh, we looked at players, we charted players, and uh, pretty much on a, on a weekly basis, I would send didn't matter which players, Canadian, German players, uh, university players, American League players, I would send reports to Mr. Schultz and to Franz, and very extensive reports. And, you know, so I would do that all the time to stay fresh, keep the organization fresh. Yeah, we didn't sign a lot of the players, but in the summertime, Franz and I discussed a lot of players that might be able to play for the Penguins per the budget this season. And and then uh, the final decision was made on some of those players. But uh, so again, it was a different, uh, I was looking at the Penguins from a different capacity as a, whatever you want to call it, a senior advisor or scout or whatever. And I was very happy to do that. And, but I'm real happy to be back coaching again. I still think I have lots of life in me as a coach. Uh, I, you know, I believe I have at, at least, I mean, there's some coaches that coach into their 70s in college hockey, and college hockey is very intense. So. We'll see. I'm just here right now to try and get us into the playoffs. Uh, you know, I don't want to put a, a stamp on anything yet because it's a tough road to hoe. Right now it's not a good situation. Uh, we'll, I'll do everything in my power to make it a better situation and do everything in my power to get these guys to play the way that they're capable of playing. Uh, so, it, you know, uh, but getting away from the question that uh, Karsten had mentioned, it was a long, uh, the, the, decision, the decision was based upon a couple things for me to come. One was uh, working for Mr. Schultz and, uh, and the Krefeld Penguin organization. I, I've been here now seven years while well, counting scouting almost eight, to eight, eight and a half years. And so, uh, you know, there was other jobs available in different capacities with different organizations in North America and here, but I liked what I was doing for Krefeld even as opposed to really pushing to get a National League scouting job. Uh, I wanted to, if I'm going to scout, I was still scouting for Krefeld, and uh, so, uh, so that, was, that, that helped in the decision. And just, I do have a good relationship with Mr. Schultz because he knows my work ethic and my knowledge of hockey. And I think that's important in any owner that you work for. And uh, so again, I strayed away from the question, but my wife and I, we spent, we spent, when we made the decision to come, I needed a day to think about it. We thought about it, we discussed it, and that's why I got off the topic was because of Krefeld being a great place and we have many friends here and we love the rink and the fans. But anyway, so we decided once I said yes, and it was a spur of the moment thing, uh, we decided to pack up. We had all our Christmas stuff. The house was all set up for Christmas with all my German houses. I had probably 15 of them and the Christmas tree and everything, and I packed everything up in one day as quick as I could. Got the house all packed up for the winter time, and uh, my wife did what she needed to do, and it was a day and a half of quick packing. And to be honest with you, we barely made it to the airport. My kids picked me up, and we got to the airport and got on the plane, and, and so we haven't stopped since. I think we were going yesterday till midnight. And I'll just tell you a funny story about yesterday. We, we did so much yesterday, moved into the place, uh, came to meet the office people, seen some of the players, uh, got set up in the office, and then uh, last night my wife and I finally around, we went through the Christmas market, I don't know, about 8 o'clock, we hopped in the car, we got something to eat because we hadn't eaten all day. Um, and then uh, we forgot where we lived. <laughs> we didn't forget, we knew where we lived, but we'd never been to the place before. So we knew the area where it was, and we couldn't find the street. We're driving up and down different streets, and finally we found it. It took about it took about 45 minutes, and finally we found it. So it was just a different area because I'm so used to living in Bochum. So 
Shemansky's in my place now, and he'll be benched for that tomorrow. But <laughs> <laughs> nothing I can do about that. But yeah, but it was kind of funny. But you know, it was a long, long day, long day, and uh, we didn't sleep good last night. But uh, I thought practice was good this morning. I thought the guys were energetic. So uh, I'm here. I'm glad to be here. I hope I can make people happy. That's all I want to do. I want the players to be happy. I want the players to work hard. I don't want them to be nervous. Uh, I'm excited about trying to get them into the playoffs. Sure, you're a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit nervous. I want the fans to be happy. We, we just need that support from the fans. Uh, whether it's a good play or a bad play, or if we lose a game, and I know we can't afford to lose many games, or the playoffs will be out of reach. So uh, uh, we're going to do everything we can. And I think we should all be on the same page to try and make this happen. So you were here since yesterday, that Wednesday. So can you describe your first impression of the team? Did you already talk to, to the team? And uh, no, it was kind of interesting. I came, I, I'd, uh, I'd, and it was really nice. My wife and I pulled up in the parking lot, and Daniel Pieta greeted us. And Pizzi, you know, he never had a smile on his face. Uh, and he was there, you know, and he hugged my wife before he hugged me. So obviously he liked my wife better than me. But that was nice to see him out there. And then I came back a little bit later to see some of the office staff. and. Four or five of the guys were in here learning German, which I thought was great. Uh, they take German classes every Wednesday. And uh, I didn't know they were in here, and they seen me out there, and they come out to say hello, and just said, uh, you know, we're really happy that you're back, and it was kind of nice of them. And, uh, and then this morning at practice, I gave, them a, I gave them a little speech this morning about life in general, about playing together, sticking together, and uh, how important it is for the organization that we make the playoffs, and I asked them all if they wanted to make the playoffs, and uh, we had a good team together in this meeting. It was very, very positive. Told them what I was all about, although most guys know me. And I went through each player and told them how good they can be and what the good things are that they do, even if I didn't know them that well. So, And then we went through practice, went on the ice with practice, and they had some good jump. And uh, we didn't get a chance to do any power player penalty kill today because I didn't want them on the ice for, I'm not gonna punish a team that's in last place when I don't know why, and I don't know, uh, you know, uh, the, I'm sure their conditioning is fine, they all say their conditioning is fine, but we'll find out in the game if we have enough tempo, and uh, so, no, it was, it was real good, it was real good. So tomorrow is already the derby against Cologne. Uh, can you already, or are you already able to talk about the tactics, or is it especially important to to mentally prepare with the team? Uh, as I said the first time I came to Krefeld in 2009, what's a derby? <laughs> I think some people remember that, but just joking around. No, I know the importance of the derby. Um, Cologne, is a, uh, they're a better hockey team than they were last year. Corey Clouston's a good coach. Uh, derby games are really important, I understand. We all even get a little more nervous for those games. Uh, we had a great run in my tenure against Dusseldorf in derby games. We were so-so against Cologne, maybe 500, I don't know, maybe a little bit under, but uh, we seemed to win games when we had to to make sure we were in a playoff status. So tomorrow's a big game. I believe Christian Erhoff's first game against Krefeld, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, tactic, sometimes the word tactic is used out of text sometimes. I mean, uh, yeah, I can be full of tactics. There's no question. And when you use them, why you use them, what you do is a whole different scenario. So, um, you know, we're, we, we talked about our four checking systems that we're going to use and how we need to play with tempo. Um, I would say some of our players on our team uh, are not so slow, they're deceptive. We have some deceptive players that are very good. And that's, so we need to have a good tempo. This team needs to play with tempo. We need to be authoritative. Uh, I don't want them to sit back, but again, I've got to gauge what our how our team looks. Are we fast? Are we fast enough to play the way that I need them to play? Do we handle the puck good enough? I believe we have some goal scorers in here that just aren't scoring enough right now. So we started today with a lot of shooting and just a lot of two-on-one drills, a lot of three-on-two drills to get pucks to the net and get rebounds. And that's really important because the more you shoot pucks in practice, the more chance you have to score goals in games. And right now, we've I, I know there's been some bad luck going on. Uh, with uh, some great scoring opportunities and not putting the puck in the net. So hopefully they can, I, th I told them it's important to get a lead in our home ring, and I, and I think it's really important. So, 
but we'll have everything uh, set, ready to go tomorrow for Kelowna. It's really hard because I just stepped in here. I don't have a heck of a lot of video on them. Normally I'm filled with that kind of stuff and everything and ready to go for each game. So I'm going to try and prepare that for tomorrow. And so I've met with some of the leadership guys and we went over that this morning, uh, just talking about it. So we'll set it all up and be ready to go. And I think tomorrow's, to win tomorrow is going to be more of an energetic thing. Energetic, play for the team, play your positions. And uh, as I told both goaltenders, I don't know either one of them that well. I know Troidel when he played in Hamburg, I had Patrick Galbraith. I know had a good last eight games last year or whatever it was. And, uh, but I told them they both have to steal some games. You got to steal some games. You're both great goaltenders. Help us get to the playoffs, steal some games, such as Lankow would and Duba would every now and then. And these guys are capable of it. So they need to know that they're capable of it. And I want them to feel confident. Our uh, stressing, stressing game tactics uh, speech-wise today, be more visually tomorrow. <coughs> <coughs> Gibt es Fragen an Rick oder auch natürlich an Entschuldigung? Rick, uh, did you know a few players from the, from the new players that you have now in your team? Uh, I knew them because Franz and I would talk in the summertime and we'd have conversation and you know he'd ask me certain questions which I thought was really healthy uh, and he respected my experience and I respected his youth and uh, so I knew some of the players. I, I knew Mike Little a little bit because he played a bit with Ezer Lone in training camp uh, one year. And uh, I didn't know him too well from Florida to the ECHL. But when you're the player of the year in the ECHL, you got to have something. You're the best defenseman. Uh, Kluber Tantz, I knew him a little bit from when I scouted uh, in 2012 when he played Houston. And he played very well for, for uh, Hamilton in those playoffs against Houston. And so I knew him when he played Nuremberg. Uh, so uh, Rosa, I know Marco from the East Coast League, he was supposed to play for me in Long Beach and he ended up being in the American Hockey League after that. And so I told those guys, both of them, Hambly and Rosa, how much I respected the way they played for Wolfsburg and how we need that winning attitude with the Krefeld Penguins and that's why they're both here. Uh, they need to be big factors and, and that's, that's why they were added to the team. So yeah, I, I knew, uh, I know most of the most of the players, I mean, even the young Germans such as Oren Doris, you know, I, I know Kevin from, you know, the early years, and, and uh, so I pretty much know everybody in some way. The only, oh, again, I made a mistake this morning, <laughs> but again, I'm only human. I was telling Kluber Tantz how good he played against uh, Houston, and I'm looking at him in the face, and Nick St. Pierre was coach. You're talking to Bayonet. <laughs> so I, I thought that was Kluber Tantz, but Kluber was sitting down the other end of the room, so. It's just you see so many faces all at once, and you're talking to players, and you want to say something to them. So I told them I did it on purpose. Make sure you have to pay attention, right? Yes. Rick, talking about the goalies, who will be going to play? We're going to make that decision in the morning, but we're leaning towards going with all the import players that play defense or forward tomorrow so I can see what we have. So I can see what we have. Uh, I don't know. I know Gail Braith was pretty good under pressure last year, and so if we go with Troidel, I mean, I think that you should have two goalies here. You got a good German goalie, and that that means we'd probably bring Patrick Klein to back up. So that's the way we're leaning right now because I need to see what Matt Carey can do. I mean, I, it's hard to tell in one game, but I want to get all the I want to get all the the Stürmer and Vitaiger and see what they do. Uh, did you drop France into here in I, you know, I've, uh, I've, I texted Franz the day after, and normally we talk right away, and I, I, I sent him a long text uh, about holding his head up, and he's going to be still be a great coach someday, and he's a good coach right now, and so I haven't heard back from him yet, but uh, it, it, it's a tough situation. It's a tough situation, and little, you know, so, uh, and it's not for me to say. Maybe other people feel different, but <clears throat> you don't see it now, but it helps you grow. It really does. I've had it happen to me a few times, and regardless how good we think we are as a coach, we it happens, and uh, it makes you a better coach. It really does. And did, you, did you see some of the uh, games in Summer Bay? Yeah, uh, a few of them. I would watch the highlights, more or less. I'd watch the highlights and just look at things, and sometimes fans would call, and you know, I'd look at the highlights of the Penguins, and I'd send, <coughs> send some notes on what I thought maybe happened and why we got scored against and 
uh, you know, sometimes we got scored against. I mean, he, you know, you're trying to get them to play their positions and they make a mistake. It's, you know, sometimes the coach can't be out there. You know, it's not, not really the coach's fault a lot of times, by any means. You said you, you talked to the players. Uh, did they um, tell you what the problem was the last, the last game? No, no, no players said anything about any problems. And I don't, I, you know, I mean, when I'm in that position, I, I, I'd be happy not to be talked about. But nobody really said anything. Everything was pretty positive. They just felt that, uh, you know, they need to score more. And uh, nobody really said anything. We didn't really want to talk about it. I think our job is just to get on the ice and try and play hockey the way that we can and win hockey games somehow. Even if it's the worst game of the year, if we win it, then that's a good game. But I hope we play with good tempo, and we're getting a lot. Uh, and I know they've been getting lots of shots on net. But I think a key to winning is, as I've always said, give up under 25 shots if we can. Tough thing to do, but if you can do that, you stand a chance of winning. And uh, so. You know what? I have no idea. All I know is that in the good years in Krefeld, when we ended up second, third, fourth, they were unbelievable. They were unbelievable. And even when we ended up tenth, we had to win four to five to get in. That's still a great job. And they were still really happy then. And we should have knocked off Wolfsburg, but we didn't. And then last year, I have no idea what the heck happened. I mean, we were only five, eight, and three. It's not a bad record, and it was early in the season, but they got rowdy, and I mean, you know, I, uh, sometimes you get spoiled. I mean, I guess we set too high of a bar here by ending up high in the standings, and they weren't happy with being 10th place anymore, and so I guess you can't blame them, but I, I remember one time saying to Puka, when we were in second place and we were walking out and they announced our names and I heard some whistling and I just looked at Puka in the hallway and I said, well, there you go. I said, we're in second place and they're still booing us, so I don't know, maybe we got to, I don't know what we have to do. But no, you know what, I, I, I got to say, you know, uh, uh, and, and a funny thing is being back in North America, I always preach to them how great it is with the fans here in Germany. It's, it's unbelievable. You, you can't help but be motivated. And they got to come over here to see it. Because all the hockey games that I won, I watched a ton of hockey games the last year. And I'm sitting in the stands, and even at an NHL game, an American League game, I'm thinking, my God, lots of people in the rink, but it's deader than a doornail. And nobody <laughs> ever, yeah, and nobody ever blames the coach in North America, you know, until it gets really, really bad. But over here, it's more of uh, the coach's fault if you don't win, which I disagree with a lot of times. I think if you're a proven coach, you're a coach for life. If you're an unproven coach, then I say, well, then maybe they have something to cry about. But because uh, coaching's a tough business, you know. But uh, I, I I I appreciate the German way of cheering. It's unbelievable. And I I've always said Krefeld has the best fans. I coached in Iserlohn. Their fans were great. But some of those winning years we had here, my God, would I love to see that again? Would I love? To, I'd love to make the playoffs, and I'd love to see the fans standing and clapping for the last five minutes of the game. I'm hoping I'm hoping to see that again. I don't care. If they ever cheer for me, I really don't. I just want these guys to make the playoffs, be happy, love Krefeld, and I'd like to work here as long as I can and have success. Rick, can you imagine that the so-called social media have an influence on fans' behavior and their readiness to make negative criticisms of players and coaches and organizations yeah, more you know, than, uh, than uh, years know. before? And I, 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 you know what, that social media stuff, I mean, I, I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, you got people, uh, and, and to be honest with you, I don't go on it. I'm not on Facebook. Uh, I don't go on any of that stuff. But when you, you hear about it, you hear about it. Uh, I've got my young son coaching three kids teams at home. And he was talking about social media the other day. I had to tell him not to worry about it. His, all his teams are in first place. But he's still, because his kids are the best players in the league, they badmouth them. So no matter which way you look at it, it happens. But I think, I mean, how many people are on social media? Maybe 100 in some circumstances. How many people really know anything about hockey? You know, and, and they all have their opinion. But who knows about the coach? Do they know you personally? Do they know what you do at practice? Do they know how you teach the game? You know, and so it's, I mean, yeah, social media, social media is freedom of speech, but sometimes I would rather appreciate somebody coming to me and talking to me 
if you, have, you don't like me or you, you want to know about my hockey knowledge, come and sit down with me and I'll sit down with you and let's talk hockey. And then you'll see what a person's all about. And it's almost like if you're working for someone and you're uh, a plumber and I go on social media and say, this guy's terrible. He can't <coughs> solder a pipe or heck, he can't, he can't do anything. And the guy loses his job. Well, how would you feel if you were that plumber? That's, that's the same circumstances. You know, so I mean, I, I don't think it's right. And then there's also another philosophy that's gone on in Krefeld for ever since I've been here. Oh, Rick Aduno doesn't play the young Germans or develop the young Germans. You know what? I'm going to stand up for myself 100%. Nobody in this league has played more young Germans over the years than me on the fourth line or the third line. Christian Kretschmann played the power play. Kevin Orndorff mm -hmm. has played the power play. Uh, Steve Hanusch played the power play. Patrick Klopper played the power play at times. Uh, Normie Honor played the power play for three months straight. Uh, we gave them every opportunity and worked very, very hard to develop these people. Very, very hard. And I, I spent way more time with them. When I coached junior hockey, I put 60 kids in Division I college out of junior hockey as a coach. You know how much money that is? That's $100,000 for each kid for four years. 60 kids in Division I. I won the scoring in American League hockey, I won the scoring in junior hockey, so I'm a player at that also that knows how to teach development. So can you imagine what, what that knife is that goes through your heart when they say, Rick Aduno doesn't develop young players? Are you kidding me? That's absolutely insane. That's crazy. So I just wanted to make that very clear. There's nothing more that would make me happier, even more than the imports, is to see Kevin Orndors or somebody else score big goals. But there comes a point where you have to show your worth to play those guys in those critical situations. So, I mean, I just wanted to speak my mind on that a little bit because I know that that's been a knock against me and I'd like to know where the heck that comes from because that is not true. If you watch practice, I stay out there with the Germans more than I would ever stay out there with the pros or the young, uh, or the uh, imports because the imports have to be pros to help teach themselves a lot of time. We're not bringing an import in here to develop them. Not a chance. Import comes in here and you're a developmental import. Get lost, we can't use you but we've always took our pride in developing German players. Ollie Mabus played the power play. I had him stand in front of the net sometimes. So almost every young German that we've had had a chance to play on the power play. I remember Erhoff and I talking one year or two when we just had, we had some injuries. He said, Rick, let's use Kretschmann on the power play when we had the lockout. We used Christian Kretschmann off the post because he had that little stuff play and we used him for a while and power play gave him an opportunity. So you got to run with it when you get that chance. But it's the big boys that prove themselves and get the chance, such as over the years, Vasily have proved themselves as a, as a German. And, you know, he had all the power play time. Those, those, those guys prove themselves. So we want to see that happen. We don't want to lose our development here with young Germans. Not a chance. Not a chance, guys. We want to be known for that with Krefeld and try and win at the same time. So we're just uh, really your assistant coach now? didn't really know what was going on. We, we had a lot of conversation and then, uh, you know, I discussed some things with Mr. Schultz and, uh, and then uh, when I got here I met Billy and to my knowledge I guess Elmer is back with the DNL team and uh, which Elmer is a very outstanding guy. I, I love Elmer Schmitz, he's a good person. And Billy has been with the organization so um, I didn't know him from a hole in the ground yesterday. We had some good conversation. Uh, so he, uh, I'm going to give him his opportunity to run the defense, help me out with some drills, get to know him a little bit. We don't have a lot of time, we've got 22 games. So I told him I'll help him with the defense too. I said, don't worry about it, I'll, uh, I'll help guide you. I just want you to feel comfortable about who you put on the ice. So we'll talk, about, we'll talk to the defense too about their pairs, who they're comfortable with. And I think something important, and, and, I, and I'm, a, I'm a guy that likes to change lines too, too, because I think you can win a game sometimes, switching one guy at a critical time. But if we can keep uh, the togetherness of the lines, hopefully we can do that. Hopefully. And the defense pairs, it'll make it stronger to maybe get to where we want to go to make the playoffs. So that's what we're going to try and do. Will it happen? I don't know. I don't know. And so that's where we're at. <coughs> I told the boys this morning, our fourth line, don't even think about scoring. If you do, great. Just be a great checking line. Just be a great checking line. And I heard Mike Miskowski was probably our best player the last game or two. And that's important. Some of the players told me that today. So, uh, so Mike, you know, Mike had Mike killing penalties for a while last year until he got hurt. 
and his energy and his forecheck ability, we, you need that to excite the fans. You need somebody going out of the pocket and, and finishing the body and turning pucks over. <laughs> Mike's got a great wrist shot, so hopefully it, it works out. They just have to believe in themselves. When you're losing, it just, it's tough. It's tough. You doubt yourself, and I told them don't doubt themselves. Just let's try and get the lead in some games, and away we go. When Mike is the best players, and something is wrong. <laughs> when Mike, well, it's a <laughs> it, yeah, it's a credit to him. It's a credit to him, but yeah, I mean, maybe maybe more of the hardest working player, or turning pucks over or something. You know, maybe maybe it's uh, maybe I verbalize it wrong, but yeah, you know, if you look at it this way, I mean. Uh, Tim Hamley said to me today, Rick, he said, what a compliment to Kretschmann, Muskowski, and uh, Yard Hagos. They were our best line in the playoffs against Wolfsburg that year, just because of work ethic. They were our best line. And unfortunately, Yard just, sometimes that happens. You just lose your legs over the summer and, and your strength. And he was a hard-working guy off the ice, but that didn't pan out last year because of that. But, you know, that was a great line in the playoffs. That's what we need right now. So maybe if Pieta, Pieta and uh, Umesovic and, uh, and Mueller, you know, can get it going for 22 games, we'll be in the playoffs if they stay together as a line and they can get it done. And I told Mueller today, I said, how many goals do you have? He says, 10. I said, you should have 30 right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's my belief. Go back, I agree. My name is Uli Hartmann, I'm writing for Süddeutsche Zeitung. I have two questions. Could you tell me the name of the city you spent the last year in Canada? Thunder Bay. Th Thunder Bay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And once again, the decision to come to Crayford for the second time. You were preparing for maybe calm and cozy Christmas in Canada, and then you get a call from Germany. And what's it like to decide to take the stress again instead of calm Christmas? Yeah, it's, you know what, it's, <laughs> it's stressful, very stressful. I mean, you, you know, I could have kept doing what I was doing, but I love coaching. Uh, it's unfortunate it happened under the circumstances it did, but uh, yeah, the first thing you want to do is stay home and enjoy Christmas with your family, you know, and uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but my younger, my, my grandson said to me, my oldest grandson said, Papa, I hope you get fired again. <laughs> he didn't want me to go. So, you know, but that's, that's the way it is, you know, and, uh, but you know what, they love me coaching. I mean, uh, we, we, I go on the ice with, the, with my grandsons and I work with them and I'm proud to say that three of the four are the best players in Thunder Bay and that's a pretty, for my eight-year-old grandson is the best player by far in Thunder Bay. And probably one of the best in Canada right now. Well, then he can come over and throw yes. <laughs> He takes the puck, he skates through everybody, and he's top oh, shelf or he deeks every time. And that's because he shoots pucks and he skates every day. He's a forward. He's a forward. forward. Yeah, he's a so forward. Next you're I mean, that could end. I mean, that could end in five years. Who knows? <laughs> Things change. But right now, he loves the game, and he's just so naturally talented. It's unbelievable. So it's a pleasure. I would watch him play. And, I watched a lot of hockey, university games, I watched a lot of university games, a lot of American League games, and university, I was, I've been charting German-Canadian names, and there's, there's quite a few, can they play in the DEL as a German-Canadian, that's the question, you know, that's why you have to, that's why scouting is important, to make sure you see guys play two or three times, at least, but you, to answer your question, yes. very stressful to make that decision. I did it six years ago or seven years or eight years ago when I came here in 2009 and that was December the 13th I think we came and then uh, we thought we, we really thought we were going to be home for Christmas so we were all prepared and then we just my wife looked at me and she said you know what you make up your mind right now if you want to go she says we like Krefeld don't fool around and I said do you want to go she said yeah I said let's go so, and I have a third question. Uh, last year the team was in a difficult situation and you quit. This time the team was in a difficult situation and you say, yes, I do it, I help. What's the difference? Well, I don't know if I quit. I would never use the word quit because I don't quit. I never quit. So there's a, a way.
way around that. There was discussion there, but I never quit. I will never quit. Uh, never been a quitter, and uh, we're in a different, we're in a difficult situation right now. And you know what? Whatever happens, happens. Does that change? The, here's the philosophy. Does that change me as a coach? I've been coaching now for almost 25 years, so I want to make the playoffs. If we don't make the playoffs, is Rick Aduno a bad coach? Absolutely not. I get more knowledgeable every day. I try to find ways to motivate every day. So if I was, if I coached three or four years and this was happening, then you said I was a bad coach, then maybe I'd have to think about it and still try and get better. But under these circumstances, uh, no. And that's how I came here in 2009. I thought, I got to get it done. And if I get it done, great. And we got it done. So, uh, but I need the help of the players. I need the, they've got to play hard. They've got to score. So, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm, I'm worried about it in a sense that I want the team to make the playoffs. But it's, I'll be very disappointed if we don't. But it's not going to change my philosophy or, or uh, that uh, is, uh, am I not a hockey coach? Uh, absolutely, I've been a lifer coaching hockey. So, and I'm well respected by a lot of people. And a lot of people can't believe that I lasted eight years or seven and a half in Germany. Because it's a tough, tough thing to do. Yes, but once again, what's the difference between the situation last year and now? Uh, I don't know, it's a tough question to answer. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I think, I think maybe last year, last year I think everybody really got too excited too soon, and I don't understand why. They got way too excited too soon. Uh, with something going on behind my back even before we started, before the team struggled, I don't know. I heard rumors about it when I went home in the summer after I signed a two-year contract. We just ended up in second place and I was coach of the year the year before and you hear rumors about uh, somebody might replace you. I mean, it makes no sense to me, but you know, uh, it is what it is. But uh, yeah, so I mean, I don't know, there's no difference. It just last year was everything out of context. Everything out of context. What were we out of the playoffs last year? Maybe, maybe six points, four points. I don't know. Somewhere around there. We're 16 games into the season. I think. I think everybody got way too excited, and even the fans. I think they lost track of. Like I said, we we're spoiled. Krefeld ended up in the top six uh, three years in a row, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, your coach wins four out of five the year before that to get you in, and or the players was able to push them to get us in and then all of a sudden you come into the next year and everybody wants you gone. It just Is it a fact that, oh, it's time just to have a different face, make a change? You know, so that stuff kind of gets to you a little bit because you know what you are as a coach and like you said, social media stuff, you know, uh, people read social media and they do that. I don't think anybody should read social media. I think, you think the NHL pays attention to, do you think the NHL pays attention to social media? Not a chance. Michelle Therrien would have been fired last year if they paid attention to social media 15 times last year. He gets Carey Price this year and he gets Radulov, now he's the best coach in the NHL. And he, should, he, he lost 24 games in a row last year, I think it was, Some, somewhere around there. Mike Babcock, the best coach in the world, coach in Toronto Maple Leafs, ended up 30th place last year, but yet he won with Team Canada and they say he's the best coach in the world. And now he's still he's struggling with the Leafs to make the playoffs, but he's got the young talent that they're giving him time to develop. So. Uh, you know, you got two great coaches there. That uh, Toronto one with Montreal, two of the hockey hotbeds, and nobody's nobody's firing them. You know, and so we're talking about firing them. So, like I said, if I was a one-year, two-year, three-year coach in the business, it's deserved. But not when you've been in the business this long. It's one thing if I didn't know the players or I was senile or something. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, it's great to be back. Gibt es noch weitere Fragen? Das ist nicht der Fall. Von daher bedanke ich mich aber bei Herrn Schulz und bei Herrn Adorno und bedanke mich bei Ihnen. Diejenigen, die ich nicht mehr morgen sehen werde, darf ich Ihnen allen im Namen der Krefeld Pinguin ein schönes Weihnachtsfest wünschen. Ansonsten gehe ich davon aus, dass wir uns morgen alle hier wiedersehen. Dankeschön. <lacht> Thank <laughs> you.